discussing PEM. The learning objectives are understanding why PEM start, its history, its definition, how to know how to address the PEM question by formulating a legal analysis, understanding the study design, conducting research, appraising critically, and evaluating the process. Why EBM? Traditionally, physicians subscribe to journals in their specialty when faced with information query. They identify the problem, search textbooks and review articles, rely on clinical expertise, ask other colleagues, and go to pharmacies and because of this tsunami of information, the practitioner has to read 17 articles per day to be up to date, which is around 45 minutes per week. This is according to a study done by JAMA in 1992. If this study was redone again nowadays, definitely the 17 articles would have increased to 30, probably, and the 45 minutes would have been decreased to 30 minutes. And also, physicians get 60 clinical questions per week, in which they answer only 30% of them. The other 70% are not personal because of lack of time and or the skills. The sources they are looking for information into is wrong. Physicians mainly consult textbooks to get information and ask from colleagues Textbooks are usually out of date, and the advice is often inaccurate. We know that if the textbook is like five years old, it becomes somehow obsolete. Social scientists, new medical products and practices disseminated to healthcare more because power and money, and rather than evidence. This is what they say. Clinical decisions rarely based on the best evidence. They are also based on what some conflict of interest negative drug disease studies how much of it got published how much of the published research is reliable how many of the results are fabricated according to article claim 1972 healthcare is not always based on evidence and according to a study in the institute of medicine done in 2003 the average period between the discovery of better treatments and their implementation. So, the average treatments, for, forget the average period between the discovery of better treatment and the implementation of the patient care is 22 years, which is too much. You can imagine how many people might be affected by the wrong, if this turns out to be wrong treatment. We do not much on educated care. We do, sorry, much of educated care, and much of educated care is not done. So, for example, half of the U.S. patients with diabetes and asthma and hypertension receive the recommended care, according to New England Journal of Medicine in 2003. So, in JAMA 1994, a study was there saying that jumbo jet loads of patients are killed every year due to the malpractice in the clinical situation, practice situation. Come again, how reliable is the medical literature? There's the Scott Rubin scandal. He was a famous anesthesiologist. He was a researcher. He published articles and people thought he was a wow person. But it turned out that he was fabricating the results. For another pharmaceutical companies. Other than Scott Rubin scandal, are experts always correct? Sometimes experts give advice lacking evidence and it proves to be harmful. For example, the beneficial effects of prenatal steroids given to mothers at risk of delivering prematurely in order to decrease the risk of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome was first reported in 1960s. By 1982, there were no enough RCT supporting this beneficial effect. Yet in the mid-1980s, an expert did a narrative review 
and warned against the use of steroids. He did not do a systematic review. Can you imagine how many babies died because of this expert? In 1989, a systematic review was done on all trials and concluded it was actually beneficial to give steroids. Furthermore, there's the deterioration of the perf in the performance of the clinicians. According to a study that was done in the UK that wanted to address the determining factors of the physicians in prescribing antihypertensive drugs, they came out with four determining factors. The level of diastolic blood pressure, the patient's age, the amount of target organ, and finally, the year of the graduation of the physician. Why is that? Because in the 1980s, the mild hypertensions used to not be treated. Later in the 1990s, they were treated using diuretics. Later then, they were treated with even more severe antihypertensives. Hence, physicians don't prescribe the same. And that's what evolved the EBM. Everybody was prescribing differently. People are getting killed. We want patients to be safe and healthy, and that's the aim of the whole healthcare system. That's why it came to be the integration of best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. According to David Sackett, which was, uh, who was the father of EBM, he was a famous American-Canadian physician and one of the pioneers of evidence-based medicine. He thinks that it's the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients, individually. So, as I have spoken, in the early 1990s, uh, it was opinion-based, according to the memory, to the doctor, the year of graduation. Then it used, and then it turned to be physician-centered. Uh, more research is done. However, the type of research selected was not super accurate or appropriate or best. And then EBM shifted to be patient-centered which emphasizes on the care of the patient. What does the patient want out of this? Medicine was the first to adopt the principles of EBM, and then other healthcare disciplines have followed, for example, nursing, mental health, dentistry, cardiology, orthopedics, etc. Although the concepts of practicing medicine based on sound evidence not yet new, but it has become formalized with additional recent refinements that have enabled pioneer uh, practitioners to approach medical problems and evaluate the medical literature with greater consistency and to deal with massive amounts of information. We're going to be tackling the process of going about evidence-based medicine in the coming video.